Hello everyone, this is Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Uh, today we are fortunate to have Roshanda Van Leeuwen, Xavier Valve, Thomas Samuel, Jose Gabriel Martin Fernandez, and Romina Akamon with, with us to discuss off-grid energy storage. One important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Now before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. Now, if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. By doing so, we eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. Now, if you select the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and the audio pin number you should use to dial in. Panelists, we ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if you have any technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinar's help desk at 888-259-3826. Now, if you'd like to ask a question, and we encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the webinar, uh, we ask that you use the questions pane on the right where you can type in your question. If you're having any difficulty viewing the materials today through the webinar portal, you can find PDF copies of the PowerPoint at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. And you may follow along as the speakers present. I'll also send out that link um, via the chat pane on the right. Also, an audio recording and the presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few weeks. Now, we have an exciting agenda prepared for you today that is focused on off-grid energy storage. Uh, we will hear an introduction from Roshenda, followed by Xavier, who will be presenting the Alliance for Rural Electrification's new position paper on off-grid storage. We will then hear from Thomas. Jose and Romina, who will be presenting case studies on projects from their respective organizations. Now, before our speakers begin their presentations, I'd like to provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. Following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session, and then wrap up with some closing remarks in a very brief survey. Now this slide shows a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be. The Solution Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial and is supported through a partnership with UN Energy. It was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Outcomes of this partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as the webinar you are attending today. The Solution Center has four primary goals. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. It also serves to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. The Solution Center pro delivers dynamic services that enables expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And lastly, the Center uh, fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. Now this slide provides a bit of oh, oh, Now our accent expert is a marquee feature that the Solution Center okay. provides. Ask an expert is a valuable service offered through the Solution Center. 
We have established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries and at no cost. So providing expertise in the air area of energy access, we are very pleased to have Ellen Morris, Associate Professor of Professional Practice in International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Ellen is also a founding partner of Embark Energy and President of Sustainable Energy Solutions. Additionally, we have Abraham Remen, Director of the Social Transformation Division at the Energy and Resources Institute in India, serving as an expert on rural electrification with renewable energy. So if you need policy assistance on energy access needs or any other clean energy sector. Just an update. Java did an update. Sorry about that. If you need policy assistance on energy access needs or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this useful service. Again, this assistance is provided free of charge. And to request assistance, you may submit your request by registering through our Ask an Expert feature at Clean Energy Solutions dot org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. So we encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the expert policy assistance, subscribe to our newsletter, and participate in these webinars. Now I'd like to provide brief introductions of our distinguished panelists. Today we will begin with an introduction from Rashanda Van Leeuwen. Rishanda is the Executive Director of the Energy Access Initiative, overseeing the UN Foundation's work on energy access and its engagement with the UN Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. Next up is Xavier Valde, Board Member, International Consultant and Partner with Trauma Techno Ambiental, as well as a member of the Board for the Alliance for Rural Electrification and Sakartis. Today he will be presenting the Alliance for Rural Electrification's new position paper on off-grid storage. Following Xavier, we will hear from Thomas Samuel. Thomas is the founder of Asuna Design and will be speaking to us about their work in the Syrian refugee camp Zatara. After Thomas, we will hear from Jose Gabriel Martin Fernandez. Jose is the project man manager of the Ashiona Microenergy Foundation, and will be presenting on their Luz in Casa, or Light at Home project in Peru. And finally, we are from Romina Acamone Garcia, International Business Development Manager for Renewable Energy at the Trojan Battery Company. Ramona will be presenting the Trojan Battery Company's Spice Village Resort in India. And with those introductions, I'd like to welcome Rashonda to the welcome, uh, webinar. Okay, thanks. Um, as I was saying, and sorry, I just we had some technical difficulties at this end. Um, we've been uh, very pleased to have uh, the Clean Energy Solutions Center as such a strong partner with us um, in the work on energy access uh, and for sustainable energy for all overall, and certainly um, for any uh, government uh, uh, governments who may be um, on the call with us this morning. We can not uh, overstate the value of the technical expertise that is available on a pro bono basis um, to help with uh, aspects of policy development that uh, was just mentioned in the introduction. Um, from our standpoint, um, uh, many of you are familiar already with the Energy Access Practitioner Network that we run out of uh, the UN Foundation, but as a contribution to the broader Sustainable Energy for All initiative and as a, a network of networks in many ways to help bring together um, global experience and expertise um, around uh, what is happening in the energy access sector, um, what is happening more broadly on uh, particularly um, low carbon energy solutions and where uh, we can be bringing those innovations um, into uh, field settings uh, much more quickly through helping to disseminate uh, it, uh, knowledge and sh knowledge sharing throughout the sector. Uh, we work in many other areas as well, but one of the pieces that we have seen is, is absolutely critical um, is the energy storage uh, aspects because um, we recognize that uh, um, there have been a lot of innovations, but we still have a, a long way to go in this sector, and so we're 
very excited this morning to be able to listen from some experts, both in terms of uh, Trojan's perspective on developing battery uh, innovations, but also from the field's perspective of um, how things are, are working in the field. So next slide, please. If you're not familiar with the overall um, Sustainable Energy for All initiative, just very quickly, this is an initiative of the United Nations Secretary General and now the World Bank President, um, Jim Kim, as well, which was launched in 2011. It has three global objectives for us to achieve by 2030, the first of which is ensuring universal access to modern energy services. That's where um, we in the Practitioner Network are really focusing, particularly on the electrification aspects of um, access to modern energy services. Additionally, the second objective is doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency, and the third one is doubling the, the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix, and both of those very much play into the energy access sector as well. The UN General Assembly following on a very successful UN International Year of Sustainable Energy for All has declared 2014 to 2024 as the decade of sustainable energy for all. For those of us who are working um, on the ground, this is very important because uh, it really sets the context to ensure that UN agencies, the United Nations, the Secretary General, uh, member states of the, U the United Nations will be maintaining the focus um, on uh, different aspects of energy and how it relates to sustainable development for the coming 10 years. Um, within the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, we already have 72 um, uh, countries engaged already and uh, in the initiative and they have all committed to um, action plans and, uh, around energy access within their own particular country context as well. So again, we are uh, really looking to ensure that all of the relevant applications um, within a systemic approach but also within um, individual pieces of that are brought to the table as we engage with government, as we look at policy, as we look at practice as well. Next slide, please. Um, again, just to say that we launched the Energy Access Practitioner Network in 2011 as a contribution towards the development of uh, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative and really to bring the voice of um, companies and organizations and investors focusing on the contribution of mini-grid and off-grid solutions towards the achievement of uh, universal energy access. It's not that we're opposed to grid extension, um, but uh, that we really see that there is a very strong contribution through uh, mini-microgrids and all through so off-grid solutions. And they all require um, certain components of energy storage. Today we have 1,400 members in the network. Um, it's grown very quickly. Um, we have a number of battery companies who are part of that network and all of us uh, pretty much um, use batteries in one shape or form for, uh, for storage for the solutions that, that, are, that are utilized. So um, we recognize that uh, about 60% of the people globally um, do require uh, microgrid and decentralized energy solutions and not only are we learning how to um, implement these in uh, many different developing country contexts, but particularly on the microgrid side, there's also very strong engagement and interest uh, in other markets like the US where in fact we're looking at more decentralized approaches to help with energy security going forward. So um, about a quarter of our members currently are working um, primarily on energy storage, although as I said, uh, more broadly, um, everybody really uh, needs um, different types of energy storage for, for their work. Um, I'll be moving on now to, uh, I think, the, the Alliance for Rural Electrification, I think, um, uh, is our next panelist. Um, and uh, we work very closely with ARE, um, uh, more broadly in the network, and uh, we're delighted to be able to help showcase its new off-grid storage position paper. So thanks very much, and I'll hand the baton to the next speaker.
Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, Xavier Valvé from uh, Barcelona. Good uh, morning or afternoon to everyone. Uh, my uh, presentation uh, is to introduce uh, a position paper that has been uh, uh, edited by uh, Are and that it's uh, available uh, to anyone that wishes to, to have it. Uh, I will first uh, make some uh, preliminary comments. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, yes. Uh, the, the reason why uh, we are uh, looking at uh, engaging in off-grid renewable energy technologies, of course, is the access to the, to the large uh, number of people unelectrified, but also to people that uh, have access to electricity, but that technically they, they we are what we consider uh, to be under-electrified because the quality of the service uh, is poor in general. So, uh, out of this, uh, a large uh, part of the, of the potential uh, market uh, development is going to be with uh, off-grid solutions and uh, this, if done with uh, renewable energy, uh, offers uh, great opportunities to both electrify and do it in a sustainable, in a sustainable way. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, in this case, uh, we, I'd like to, to, to say that this is not a challenge uh, for policy makers and for uh, institutions, but it's also a direct challenge for the business uh, sector. And uh, we have this association uh, called ARE that is a, a platform uh, essentially focused on the industry. We are uh, at, at present uh, 70 members mainly from industry but also some institutions representing academia and the public sector. And uh, our activities uh, follow three service lines. Uh, business and intelligence support, uh, public affairs support, and uh, supporting administrations. Next, please. Here we, you have some of the logos of uh, the wide variety of uh, institutions and companies that are members of uh, uh, ARE, which uh, are worldwide. Europe, uh, the Americas, uh, Asia, uh, essentially from uh, Oceania, all parts of the world. Next. Just as a, as a brief uh, uh, summary of some of the features that uh, ARI, through a technical secretariat, uh, offers to its uh, members and to the public in general is that we organize different uh, activities uh, focusing on different technological uh, aspects and for example during 2013 uh, regarding uh, countries we have been focusing in Africa and Latin America and during the first semester of 2013 the focus was on small wind and the second was uh, the second semester was on energy storage, and this document, this uh, this uh, guideline uh, that I will be presenting, was uh, was developed as part of these activities. Uh, in 2014, the focus uh, regarding technology will be on small small hydropower uh, and hybrid hybridization uh, and power components, and then for 2015, uh, we we would like to be working on biomass and, and mini grids. So uh, then, uh, this campaign that we have uh, uh, focused on energy storage has had as an objective to improve uh, the business framework 
based on, on recommendations uh, of the Alliance uh, to create also awareness of the potential of this specific technology. Uh, it was active the, uh, through, a, through a task force from July uh, and it will be going on until the December of 2013 and uh, the, uh, the, the, the strategy is uh, to, to give uh, to, to access to the network of practitioners and decision makers and uh, trying to uh, enable private and public dialogue uh, and uh, to channel uh, research articles and, and uh, journalistic activity. So let us uh, go on to the to the position paper, uh, like uh, which is the objective of my presentation. This is a paper, like I said, that it's available to anyone, and uh, I will go through some of its uh, key feature in a short summary. Um, please let us have the next one. It was done uh, through a task force that had as co-authors uh, a representative from uh, different uh, companies uh, throughout the world. Some of these companies, as you can see, are battery manufacturers, uh, uh, but others are practitioners. So this uh, paper uh, tries to get the expert opinion of anybody uh, that not only manufactures uh, the, the technology, but is using it in the, in the field. Next uh, slide. This uh, task force had, has as objective to improve uh, the business framework and to raise awareness. And the paper itself, uh, it's a summary that describes uh, available energy storage technologies very focused on rural electrification and uh, tries to mm, uh, highlight the, the competitiveness of each technology and, uh, and the trends in the sector and this is illustrated with five case studies and it has some recommendations uh, those would be high-level recommendations for, for decision makers and policy uh, makers. Not, it's not a, a, an engineering handbook. Yeah, I wanted just to highlight this uh, aspect as well. Next slide. So, uh, just to introduce the, the term, when we talk about energy storage, it's a very wide term, very wide concept. That means anything that st that enables uh, store uh, an, uh, a storing energy from a primary source, and that you can store it for uh, to use at a later time. But uh, here, the big difference between technologies is what pri what is the primary source, and uh, what is the time that uh, it will span between the, uh, the, uh, when you store it and when you use it. Next uh, slide. Uh, these are the big families of, uh, te of technologies used in, uh, in storage, which uh, the first one is electrochemical storage, which is the one we are most familiar with. Uh, and typically those are batteries. Yeah? The more common battery technology is the lead acid battery that we know, uh, uh, say, from our cars, yeah? but also other emerging technologies is lithium. Other well-known technologies is the nickel and sodium based uh, batteries. And also a new, well, a, a new emerging technology is uh, flow batteries. Now a lot of these technologies, the technology itself is well, has been w uh, well known for years, but some uh, are more uh, recent from the point of view of their commercial applications. As chemical energy storage we mean, uh, for example, storing hydrogen or uh, synthetic natural gas. This means that you use 
a primary source of energy, you convert it into gas, and then you store this gas that you can use at a later uh, date. And you, you can see, for example, in, the, in these uh, cases, the, the, those technologies allow you to uh, use that energy uh, a very long time after it has been stored. Uh, electrical energy storage is uh, what we call uh, typically capacitors or superconducting magnetic energy. So these would be technologies that are used for uh, short uh, periods. Mechanical energy storage is uh, flywheels. This is also a very uh, old and well-known technology, but that now uh, it has been seeing uh, uh, important uh, technological evolution to make it more efficient or uh, other examples is to pump uh, hydro, yeah, to, to reversible uh, dams for example, or compressed air. And uh, the last uh, group, it's thermal energy storage which means uh, heat, it's, it's uh, uh, heating, uh, hot water would be a simple example but also there are more sophisticated uh, technologies that allow you to store more energy in less volume, which is phase change materials, molten salts, which for example is used in concentrated uh, power solar thermal applications. Uh, this is a market segmentation that has been defined by the European Association uh, for a storage of energy. Now, the position paper that we are presenting has been focused out of those technologies on electrochemical energy storage, which is, uh, in, in particular, batteries, uh, as we, we, that we recognize it as the main technology that is uh, practically applied for off-grid with today's uh, commercial conditions. This is off-grid and backup applications. Next. Now let us look at batteries. We could classify them in different families. The lead acid batteries is the most mature technology. Often you will hear that uh, batteries are the, say, the, the weak link uh, in, in uh, off-grid uh, um, off electrification. But in general, uh, our field experience shows that they are not as as weak as, uh, as they say, that many times the batteries will not perform correctly because they are not properly treated. But if well managed, uh, you can expect very long life, uh, service life and, and cycling out of uh, the, the lead batteries. It's the most commercial uh, technology, also regarding the recycling, uh, this is well established in many parts of the world because, of course, it's a technology that uh, we share with, uh, with the market of automotive batteries, which are slightly different, but the, the, the materials are, are the same. The second uh, group is the lithium-ion batteries. That, uh, we, it's widespread for very small portable applications, like, for example, uh, cell phones. But uh, it's starting to become cost effective for, uh, for uh, bigger applications like mini grids, especially in the short term energy management. So the advantage is that they, they, uh, they are lighter, they occupy less, less volume, and uh, they are more expensive, so they have to be uh, selected for applications where they are cost effective what we call uh, nickel batteries, which is the third group. Uh, there is different uh, technology uh, options here. There is one uh, which is called the nickel cadmium uh, system, which is also well suited for rural electrification, uh, especially under uh, extreme environmental conditions, for example, regarding temperature. And uh, nickel metal hydrate are uh, well suited for uh, small uh, off-grid uh, applications like buoys, uh, street lighting, uh, where you need also, again, uh, a high uh, energy density level. 
and the fourth group is uh, sodium batteries. Those are uh, used for large applications, large what it's called grid stabilization. So they are more uh, linked to the market of the of the grid uh, distribution, and they are used for uh, power quality and what it's called peak shaving. They are maintenance free, immune to high temperatures and uh, quite uh, robust. In the, in the document, uh, in the position paper, we have selected uh, five uh, case studies which uh, will provide you with uh, a showcase of, uh, of uh, what these applications are. Uh, one is a, a village uh, resort uh, that is a case study by the by the battery company uh, Trojan, and this is an application in India. Uh, the other is a, a rural electrification in a, in a service building in a, in a head office of uh, the company uh, Rahima Frums Renewable Energy. Uh, limited from Bangladesh. Uh, there is uh, a very uh, particular example uh, which is a street light to a refugee camp uh, in, uh, in the Middle East uh, by, by uh, Suna Design of France. A fourth case study is a, a rural electrification with uh, small systems uh, for uh, individual uh, homes in South America, in Peru, and the fifth is in uh, Mozambique by the company Faisun from Germany. So you can see that we have selected uh, uh, case studies in uh, different parts of the world, but also with a different uh, size of application, relatively large hybrid uh, uh, plants or very small individual systems like they would be uh, in a in a uh, street light, for example. Next. So, out of the position paper, some of the main conclusions uh, is to create awareness that storage will plays and will play uh, a key role in achieving universal uh, access to to clean and affordable uh, off-grid electricity services. Uh, that this market is expanding very, very rapidly in uh, developing countries and emerging markets. That if we want to have a good penetration, a high penetration of renewables that are universal, universal but intermittent, like for example uh, solar uh, or a small wind, uh, we will need uh, this storage uh, to provide uh, a good quality service 24 hours a day. And uh, in this context, there are two roles that, uh, that can be paid. One is short term and the other is uh, long term energy management. So short term, you may, you may probably find it more related where you have weak grids. Uh, with uh, black, uh, off, uh, that they have blackouts and you can combine uh, uh, short-term storage and maybe some also uh, self-generation with renewables and long-term energy, ma energy management like typically it's uh, in the range of uh, several days of autonomy uh, for uh, of grid electrification. There is uh, the, the, the wide range of different battery families allows you to select the, the most uh, uh, adequate for each uh, application and if properly designed uh, the, the, the performance is quite uh, good and leading to uh, always looking at the lifetime uh, cycle uh, to cost that uh, make it quite cost effective. Uh, we also want to create awareness that uh, there is uh, different qualities available in the market and that we recommend 
to use equipment that has been certified according to international standards by independent uh, laboratories and uh, that this will be always be uh, a criteria that will help to make sure that uh, we have long time service of this uh, type of component. Next uh, slide. Uh, these are our recommendations, uh, very addressed to public authorities and regulating bodies, but also to create awareness in general uh, to agencies, uh, implementing agencies, like could be rural electrification agencies or uh, even multilateral agencies. So uh, we need to make sure that not only technology is adequate, but that we need a, a well-fitted regulatory framework. Sometimes uh, the regulatory framework, for example, has not recognized that uh, there is the existence or that there is the need to, to uh, have storage as part of the, of the electrical service. Uh, that there is need to create awareness in general. Also technical assistance, like we recognize that often the product can perform but is not properly maintained or installed and this uh, can create a problem and also that most of these technologies can be recycled quite adequately but that uh, many of the implementing agencies are not aware to, uh, to introduce the, the recycling uh, management scheme in their projects. Uh, Another recommendation is that policy targets for batteries should also be established and uh, like most of the technologies based on initial investment, uh, like for example renewables that are high initial investment but low operating costs, is that we also have to create awareness uh, among the financing uh, sector. So uh, this is uh, essentially uh, the message the, uh, that we are uh, providing uh, from ARE and uh, we uh, encourage you to download this uh, publication going to the, to the website uh, at uh, ARE which is uh, here on, on the slide www.ruralelec dot org and you can download it from uh, our uh, publications uh, where you will find other publications that have been done in previous campaigns and uh, well uh, this is uh, I will thank you very much for the opportunity to to provide this uh, this explanation and we will be uh, providing questions uh, with answers. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, thank you Xavier for your presentation. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, this case study which is bringing off-grid PV LED street lighting to uh, Syrian refugee camp Zaatari. Uh, Zaatari is a camp located in the north of Jordan. Next slide please. First let me introduce uh, briefly Suna Design. Uh, Suna Design is a startup selling LED solar street lighting solution specifically adapted to tough climatic conditions uh, developing countries in general. I personally created the company in India in uh, 2010 after uh, an experience uh, with Aurore, which is a rural electrification foundation located in South India. Um, this experience allowed me to develop a first concept of solar street lights, uh, supposedly efficient for tackling the challenges of uh, bringing light to rural area. Uh, India is an interesting market as uh, nearly 400,000 people are living without electricity. 
um, for uh, strengthening our R&D and uh, access to capital, uh, we created a company in France in 2009. And uh, as a startup, we are now uh, VC backed. And uh, that allowed us to establish uh, collaboration with uh, industry majors uh, like SAFT or R&D Lab uh, like uh, CEA. Uh, which are helping us for developing our, our technology. Um, we have executed uh, projects uh, mainly in Southwest Asia, India, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, in Africa. Next slide, please. Um, solar street lighting is one of the best way to bring public lighting uh, to area where a uh, grid will never extend and uh, people will live uh, off grid for, for some month time. Uh, unfortunately, those uh, projects are often a government project, tender based and capex driven. Uh, price matters very much and uh, there is quite uh, often no lighting requirement and only sizing of a system that uh, causes uh, integrators to assemble poor quality parts. As far as we understood uh, this market, the main technology bottleneck is on a storage lifespan. To achieve low cost, uh, most integrators, 99% in developing country, are using low quality lead acid battery with poor electronic, without intelligence, and this uh, causes uh, six months to two year uh, lifespan of the battery and a lot of maintenance. This maintenance is uh, hardly never funded by donors and the products are failing and like, staying on the field without working after, after a year. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of products not performing at the moment, and uh, we are hoping to bring a new solution that I am uh, presenting next slide. We have developed uh, this concept uh, named ISSL, standing for Integrated Solar Street Lights, uh, which is a performance-based OPEX-driven solution. Um, it's, we have uh, chosen and assembled and design the best quality parts. We are using the highest efficacy LED luminaire with uh, advanced optics system uh, that allows to reduce the sizing of the system using a smaller PV module and a smaller battery. And in terms of battery, we, have, uh, we are using an interesting technology that I am describing on the next slide. Actually, um, for ensuring a good market acceptance of the solar street lighting, we know that uh, we have to provide systems that are not maintained for a long time. Uh, we have uh, selected uh, uh, chemistry from the battery manufacturer, French battery manufacturer named SAFT, uh, which is made based of nickel and which originally used for security lighting. Uh, it has a very high resistance to temperature and then is suitable for developing countries, tropical or desert countries, and uh, can uh, provide uh, 8 to 12 year maintenance free operation with a low environment footprint, uh, which is very important where you, you are doing an eco project. And for managing this battery, we have developed an electronic, uh, which is a battery and light management system, which is a PCB on the top of the battery. Uh, the energy management system uh, allows us to track the state of energy of the battery, which is very important. It's like the fuel goes on a, on a car. Um, and this allows us to uh, guarantee the lighting without blackout. It's a patent pending algorithm which is uh, reducing the light consumption if there is uh, low energy. Uh, this is extremely important as uh, solar street lighting is meant to provide light and then security. And, uh, blackout should not be 
possible or accepted. And as far as we know, uh, this technology offers the lowest total cost of ownership uh, for solar street lighting projects. I'm presenting on the next slide uh, the case study we've been uh, talking about. Uh, we've been asked to develop a system uh, by, we've been asked by Electrician Without Border a French NGO uh, supported by the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the, the project is about lighting up the registration area of a refugee camp. Uh, as you know, the Syrian crisis is uh, getting worse and worse and hundreds of thousands of people have arrived in this camp through this registration area. Uh, 24 hours a day, so people are arriving by night, exhausted, women alone, and the, the camp needed to be lit. Uh, unfortunately, the Jordan grid was too weak, and uh, as the camp was expanding so fast, uh, there were uh, lots of blackouts, so they decided to turn for solar street lighting uh, with, uh, with a light requirement, which was technically five lux minimum with a good uniformity. Um, solar street lighting is about lighting and not a product, so we've been doing a lighting study uh, which defines the type of product of uh, lumen output of the luminaires, the pole out, uh, the pole height, excuse me, the number and the distance between poles. And this is how you define the economics of a project. Uh, so you need to lead an area and you have to choose the products which are going to procure, to produce this uh, lighting. Um, it's important uh, because most of the time uh, the, those street lighting projects are sold uh, as products uh, but not as uh, light. And on the next slide, I'm just showing two uh, very nice pictures of the results. 100 street lights have been installed on the first phase by Electrician Without Borders. Uh, very quickly, only two volunteers from the NGO installed 100 lamps in less than a week. Uh, thanks to the plug-and-play architecture, you just have to, to place the, the all-in-one luminaire on top of the pole. And uh, since uh, last November, uh, this is uh, procuring a security around uh, the sanitaires and the transit area of the camp. Um, we are hoping to deploy a thousand system in the new camp that is being built at the moment by UNHCR uh, with this new battery technology uh, and new battery management system that we have developed uh, that will uh, hopefully produce a very uh, pleasant uh, comfort and lighting for the, the refugees that are arriving uh, at the moment in Jordan. Thank you for your attention and I pass the mic to Jose. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, hello, everyone, and many thanks to the Energy Access Practitioner Network, to the Clean Energy Solutions Center, and also, of course, to the Alliance for Rural Electrification for this opportunity. I am representing Acción Amicro Energy Foundation, the corporate foundation of the Spanish group uh, Acciona, and I'm going to present you our activity in rural electrification uh, in Peru. Heather, please could you pass to the next slide, please? Thank you. During the next 10 minutes, I will present you the mission, the scope, and the activities of Fundame. Then I will focus uh, my presentation on the activities of our first social microenterprise uh, created in Peru for rural electrification through, the, through our first project there in Cajamarca, in the north of Peru, which is called Luz en Casa, uh, and, and is developed in Cajamarca, which is the, the lower region of, of Peru in terms of uh, electrification rate. 
Then I will finish describing our experience with the specific issue of energy storage in our uh, electrification projects. Next slide, please. First of all, who we are at, at Fundame, at Acciona Microenergy Foundation. Next slide, please. Fundame was created uh, to focus the company's efforts of, of Acciona in, in social development. Uh, that's the reason why uh, we focus it in the strategic business of, of our company, of, of Acciona, which are infrastructure mainly in renewable energies and also in water infrastructure. Uh, we aim promoting social development in remote rural areas in developing countries through increased access to basic services, mainly in electricity, but also in the future we will supply also services in water and other types of infrastructure. Next slide, please. Which is our scope at Acciona Microenergy Foundation? We are always thinking on a long-term project sustainability and for us that it means that we are looking for the economical, social and environmental sustainability of our implementation. We are always thinking on provide long-term services and not just focus it on the project execution. Um, how, how we reach this goal? We, we, we create we create social uh, microservice companies, usually based in a fee-for-service income model, uh, which warranty the sustainability of the project. For example, for rural electrification, we'll, we'll try to give at least 20 years of, of service. Um, and now we have created uh, two, two social micro enterprises. First, was, first one was in, in Peru, which is Acciona Microenergy Peru, and since 2012 uh, is operating our second micro social company in, in Mexico, which is Acciona Microenergy per, uh, Mexico. So we, are also, we are always focused on, on isolated rural areas, areas and, and we work with an open mind, collaborating, always trying to collaborate with, with other uh, organizations, creating partnership with them, uh, uh, for example, with administration, with government, with NGOs, other foundations, companies, etc. Next slide, please. Now I will, I will start to describe our activity in detail in, in Peru. Uh, next slide, please. Acciona Microenergy Peru is a non-profit uh, Peruvian company created in 2009 and aimed to be a sustainable energy service social micro enterprise. Our main project, Luz en Casa, uh, will benefit uh, at the end of this year, at least 3,000 households, which means 3,000 families with electricity supply, and we use to uh, to install solar home system. Uh, its uh, solar home system is composed by one solar panel of around 80 watts, one battery, lead acid battery uh, for around 100. Uh, amperes hour of capacity. We installed also three CFL lamps in each household and another one plat for to, to connect uh, an efficient radio, a, a mobile phone charger or a very efficient uh, TV. And obviously we, we control of all this the system through a through a charge controller which protect the battery of, of the deep the, the charge. And uh, Acciona Microenergia Microenergia Peru is the responsible of the execution of the installation of the project and the design and, but mainly uh, we are focused on the maintenance of the system during the lifetime of the project, which is established in twenty years. Um, the, the reason to, to, to of the 
the objective of 3,000 people, 3,000 users or beneficiaries is because this is the break-even point uh, of our um, management model which guarantee the economic and sustainability of the project. Obviously, we will we will like to arrive to a higher number of 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 people, but uh, first goal is to 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 achieve three thousand families with energy with electricity supply. In Peru, we take advantage in this in this project of a new tariff framework uh, developed by the Ministry of Energy of Peru in two thousand ten. And it means that we are under the regulated market of energy supply in Peru. We receive money from the government through the tariff, and part of this tariff is paid by the by the beneficiaries. the The goal of the of the project of the program Luz en Casa is to show the affordability for very low income people uh, located in isolated rural areas and also to demonstrate the sustainability of the program during at least 20 years of lifetime. Our main results uh, during these 40 years of experience, uh, till now we have, we are, now we are providing service, electricity services to 1,300 families through Solar Home System and we reach to be the first Peruvian rural electrific electrification company exclusively with solar power, with, with photovoltaic solar power. And this year we have another objective, an important uh, goal, which is to, to reach to the number of 3,000 people, 3,000 3, beneficiaries, 3,000 of families, through the acquisition and installation of 1,700 more solar home systems and the acquisition of this uh, equipment and the installation and the develop of this new step of, of the program is co-financed by the Inter-American Development Bank uh, through a loan of around one million dollars which will be uh, rendi through through the income so through, through the cash flow generated by the by the own project next slide please and now how we manage this program how we, we who, who, who maintains this 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 program next slide please we have designed and implemented the multi actors management models in the top of the of the management model is Acciona Microenergy uh, Microenergy Peru, which is the at least we are the at the end we are the the owner of the PV kits, the the solar home system. We are in charge of the operation and maintenance of the of the equipment, and obviously we are the responsible responsible of the sustainability of the model. In the other side, in the bottom of the slide, uh, we have the beneficiaries of this of the service, who are in charge of the payment of a, of a, a, a monthly payment of three US dollars. And th this amount is less than the amount of money that they spend 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 it before our our implementation and, and they are also in charge of clean and, and obviously care take care of the of the solar home system. Between our our activity, our organization in Peru and the beneficiaries, we create a PV electrification committees in each village who are in charge of the collection of the payments of uh, every month and they give us also a basic uh, maintenance technical maintenance of the of the equipment. Since last year, uh, we have taught uh, a part of our users, a sample of them, uh, in order to become our technical operators for maintenance activities of our equipment. They they, they have found another way of 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 income for the families through this way. 
And obviously we, we consider in this management model the local council, the, the, the admin, local administration uh, through a collaborative partnership with us, a permanent uh, communication and, and they give us any type of, of support to us and also to our PB electrification committee and also to our users. And obviously, as I mentioned, we are under a regulated market, so we have permanent in contact, in contact with the regulating authority, authority in Peru in terms of, of energy, of electricity, and they are in charge of the fiscalization of our activities and our um, work and our management model. Next, next slide, please. Thank you. And to finish, I would like to show um, to show you our most important issues identified in and related to the energy storage, which has which has been collected uh, from our 40 years rural electrification experience. Next, next slide, please. First thing, as Xavier, for example, has mentioned. Uh, we identify that not all actors involved in this sector of rural electrification are used to think in, in service. They are usually thinking in, in projects. Uh, in mid, it, it means uh, to think in a short-term view, of like one, two, or three years at maximum of operation of the, of the systems. But we believe that we must uh, think in a long-term uh, service provision, at least 20 years of, of service, to warranty the to warranty a good services for our uh, beneficiaries. Uh, specifically, in terms of battery, we think this is a, the most critical equipment of of the system uh, to warranty, specifically the, the quality the quality of the battery the of the battery to to warranty the sustainability of our model because of the expected lifetime of batteries and its high cost of replacement, which uh, its replacement impact uh, in terms of PNL of is, 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 is tremendous to our, uh, for our social micro enterprise. And if without a good quality of battery, we, we can endanger in the sustainability of the project. But uh, we have not all the conviction about the quality of the variety supply, but and, and there are two reasons, or at least we have identified two, two different reasons. First, first one was the the lack of technical data uh, uh, from manufacturers, and sometimes maybe the uh, the lack of transparency in in that data. Let me give you two two examples, which are critical for us to guarantee the, or to be sure about the, the sustainability of our model. First, first, first point is the, it's not easy to get, for example, the correct curve representing the number of, of, of cycle of the battery expected versus the deep of, deep of discharge rate. Uh, this is critical to guarantee, as I mentioned, to guarantee the, the, the lifetime of the model and and critical for the economical sustainability. And another example about the lack of technical data, um, we, are, we, we, try, we usually use a charge controller which are based on voltage to, to control or to prevent the, the, the lifetime of the, of the battery and it's in not, it, is not use, it is not easy to get uh, the battery voltage versus deep of discharge curve, uh, usually usually are not available, and this is a, an indispensable for for the adjust of our conventional charge controller. Um, and another issue: sometimes there is no coordination, or we, we don't find correct coordination between the charge controller and the battery. Uh, the charge controller supplier and the battery supplier, uh, which means a not well protection of, of the battery. This is something get from our experience and, 
and after four years of real electrification projects. But I'm thinking in the future and uh, related to the energy storage, uh, we are worried, worried about the uh, lead, at, lead active battery recycling. Remember that we are talking about isolated rural areas and we are talking about 4,000 meters of, of height and, and we expect around two or three replacement, battery replacement during the, the lifetime of the project, during the 20 years of lifetime. So for us this will be an issue, an important issue in the future, in the short, short term. And in the other hand, in the future we have also a lot of confidence in lithium batteries for solar uh, rural electrification through solar, solar technology. Next slide, please. I'm finishing. Many thanks for everyone for attending this webinar and the following presenter is Romina Arcamone from Trojan Battery Company. Romina, I give you the floor. Thank you. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Romina Arcamone Garcia and today I will be talking about an agreed commercial microgrid system that provides energy storage for a resort in India. I have a lot of interesting information to share with you, so let's start. Let's go to the next slide. So before jumping to the case study, let me introduce to you briefly Trojan Battery Company. Trojan has more than 85 years manufacturing high quality deep cycle lead acid battery, flooded and VRLA, AGM and gel battery. We have four state-of-the-art manufacturing plants, two of them located in the East Coast and two in the West Coast. With a global distribution network, Trojan serves more than 100 countries around the world. Next. Thank you. Trojan batteries are used in different residential markets, such as off-grid residential, self-consumption, rural electrification, and microgrid. Next one. And our batteries are also used for an stable grid backup and emergency backup. Next. Trojan also serves industrial applications such as solar tree lighting, telecommunication, and remote and monitoring and control. Okay, so now that you have some background knowledge of Trojan, let's move to the case study. So the Spice Village Resort is the first of a kind of grid solar eco-resort. The 65 kilowatt peak system is used to power 56, 56 cottage, two restaurants, and other service area. The solar photovoltaic system was commissioned in 2000, 2012 by our local partner, Tissu Seng, and the total cost of the system was near $3,000. So the Spice Village Resort is located uh, near the Ferry Yard Cycle Reserve in the Kerala province of southern India. As you can see in that picture, it's located in a very remote area, so it's not that easy to access and to take components to this particular area. Next one. So what was the main motivation for the project? Before the solar system was installed, the Spice Village operated a diesel genset for more than eight hours a day, seven days a week, to cover the power needs of the resort. The cost of fuel, transportation, and maintenance, as you can imagine, uh, was a huge burden. So the company decided to invest in a solar PV system, what allowed them to take advantage of governmental incentives while at the same time making the resort more attractive for eco-friendly tourists. Next one. To ensure that the project was cost-effective, the original load was reduced from 750 kilowatt peak hours and was reduced to 200 kilowatt hours. Incandescent lamps were replaced by LED lighting and necessary items were removed from the room and the use of some appliance at night had to be limited. Next. 
The microgrid system installed, as you can see in the image, consists of 65 kilowatt peak battery bay TV system. On the left, on the left hand of the screen, you can see the photo with solar panel and the building that houses the batteries and the inverter chargers. It was not easy for the installer to find a space without shade since the five village is surrounded by trees. For this reason, the 650 solar panels were installed on top of the basketball court. And we can see another image in the next slide, too, of the solar panels. Okay, next one. Since the topic of this webinar is energy storage, now we will focus on the battery bank. So for the Spice Village, uh, they use a battery bank of 72 uh, 4 volt and 1,351 ampere hours uh, Georgian industrial line batteries arranged as a 48 volt bank. The Georgian industrial line was selected for this project in part due to its 17 year service life. If we go to the next slide, I will expand on some of the important factors to select the battery and why a high-quality, a high long-lasting battery was selected. So among the main factors to consider when selecting a battery for a microgrid application are the size of the battery, the cycle life, and the service life. For a microgrid application, you need a battery that is able to handle large daily loads while cycle in a regular basis. A battery with high capacity needs to be high quality to ensure a successful operation of a demanding application. As well, the cycle life of the battery is important so that the battery don't have to be replaced in a short period of time. In this case, Georgian Industrial Line offers 2,800 cycles at 50% death of discharge, what allows to offer a very low cost per cycle. Finally, the service life it helps to determine the expected life of the battery. The IEC 61427 standard is a common way to determine the expected battery life in a PV application. This is a standard test recommended by the industry, so you should always try to get this information from the battery manufacturer. Next slide. I will not go in detail in this slide, I just want to show you how the different battery technologies are classified by cycle life. The industrial line being the red line on top in the graph, and all of the other curves uh, that are below our AGM line or our premium line or signature line. So this was the graph that um, our presenter before was talking about, about with number of cycles and the depth of discharge. Next one. Again, um, the IEC 61427 standard mentioned before is the standard for batteries using solar photovoltaic energy systems. If you want to learn more about this standard, I highly recommend watching our recent webinar about. Okay. Uh, if you want to learn more about this standard, I highly recommend watching our recent webinar about the importance of the cycle battery test. Next slide. Just as an aside, if you would like to register for upcoming webinars or watch past webinars visits, you can go to TrojanBatteryRE.com and there the resources tab, you will find all the webinars, how to size battery banks for a grid application, maintain the cycle batteries in the field, importance of this cycle battery test data and the upcoming one talking about our Georgian premium line. Uh, premium line. Next slide. Thank you. So we already talked about um, the cycle life of the battery, the service life, size, but there is another consideration when selecting a battery uh, to define if it is more suitable to use a flooded or a maintenance-free battery. So in general terms, if Maintenance is an issue 
and maintenance-free battery would be the best choice, but if line maintenance is accept acceptable, a flat battery has several advantages. One, lower cost per cycle. Two, a flat battery is easier to recharge when discharged deeply. Three, a flat battery can be overcharged to do an equalization. And four, a flat battery performs better at higher temperatures than a DRLA battery. Next slide. Okay, so to avoid oversizing the PV system uh, in this hybrid system and biodiesel genset uh, will be used in the monsoon season when the irradiation is low. If it is necessary, the diesel generator can run during the morning or the evening to cover the load and charge the battery. Next. So coming now to the end of the presentation, I want to share some information about the economics of the project. So the project helped to achieve savings of $45,000 in the first year alone. Assuming 25 years lifespan, the project total savings are estimated in $1,790,000. The economics of the project shows the excellent opportunity that uh, provides solar to replace these agencies for microgrids in commercial applications. And uh, here in the last slide, you can see in more detail all the economic and financial variables considered in the project. I will not go in detail about this, but you can revise the presentation and ask me if you have more questions by, by email. So thank you so much for your attention, and I will hand it back to Sean. Yes, thank you to all the panelists for the outstanding presentations today. Uh, we do have some time left for the questions from the audience, which we do have quite a few that came in. Again, you can ask questions through the question pane on the right. If we run out of time today, any remaining questions will be emailed to the panelists so that they can answer them. Um, so I'll begin and try to get to as many as we can. Um, we had a couple people ask questions about battery costs today. Um, so what is the cost per kilowatt hour for batteries, if you could just go over that in general, and then um, a follow-up for that um, is our cost coming down or should we find alternatives in order to make systems affordable to low-income systems? And because we have a few panelists on today, whoever uh, wants to jump in to answer the questions, feel free. So again, kilowatt hour. Uh, cost of batteries, and are those costs coming down? Well, I, I can start to provide a part of the answer. Uh, the cost per kilowatt hour uh, is, is not uh, easy to calculate because uh, often when you make the investment, you have a certain uncertainty of what is going to be the throughput. Uh, uh, of energy through the battery, uh, especially in rural electrification, because you have also a certain uh, uncertainty on the load profile. So typically, in in a in a in a house hall that has what we call uh, category A load profile, which means uh, a household that only has a load that uh, is uh, based on uh, illumination at night. Uh, on those applications, uh, typically, mm, you will have almost 80% of the energy going through the battery. So there would be batteries that cycle a lot. The more the battery uh, is cycled, the more you use its capacity. So let's say in a certain way you could say that the, the cost per kilowatt hour uh, of energy going through the battery uh, is lower. Uh, if you have uh, an electrification that has what we call a category B uh, uh, load profile, then maybe uh, part of the load is consumed 
at the same time that energy is being generated from renewable energy. So typically you'd have maybe 50 to 60 percent of the load going through the battery. Okay. So with this and going through simulation, you can try to estimate what is typically the cost per kilowatt hour of energy that has gone through the battery, if you want to calculate a life cycle cost. And uh, depending on the technology, this could go between uh, 10 uh, euro cents to 50 euro cents, depending on the size. Now, this would be a typical life cycle cost analysis. The other uh, way of looking at, this, at it is investment cost. The cost per kilowatt hour of uh, capacity of the battery. But again, uh, here you could uh, look at uh, lead acid technology that uh, maybe, well, maybe Romina can after uh, correct me, but that it could be in the order of 100 uh, to 300 uh, euros per kilowatt hour, depending on the on the type of lead acid technology. And then you could have uh, other technologies which are mm, four or five times more expensive regarding the investment, but that they have a higher cycling capacity. So mm, uh, they would be you, uh, they would have a life cycle cost which is competitive if you really use this high cycling capacity. And uh, this is the order of magnitude. Now, if the, are the costs going down? Well, we, we have seen dramatic cost reductions, say, on some of the renewable energy generating technologies, like could be PV. And, and uh, this uh, maybe has created the opinion that all the Re renewable or off-grid electrification technologies are coming down. In, uh, in the case of batteries, uh, some technologies, the costs are coming down a little bit, but the reference technology, which is lead acid, the costs are not coming down that much. In fact, lead, they are subject to the, to the fluctuation of the, of the cost of lead in the market. But uh, uh, what is happening is that there are better and better quality batteries that for the same cost will provide you a much higher cycling capacity. So that's where you gain the advantage. And maybe uh, I would uh, ask uh, Romina to complement on this as a, as a uh, battery manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Javier. And David, yeah, your answer was really um, complete. I just wanted to add to that uh, something that I mentioned very quick in my presentation. So it's hard to compare to cost per kilowatt hour of battery. The way that I will look at this is from the cycle life perspective. So when you know the cost of your battery, then you can also know like how many cycles your battery will have. And you can see that in a small car battery that it will last, you know, six months, like not many, many cycles, the cost it will be much higher than using, you know, an industrial battery that will last 2,800 cycles. So I think that we should also, when, you know, people ask this question, like in general, like if they really are interested to know uh, how much the battery will last and eventually like the long-term uh, cost of the battery for, for the project, they should look also at the cycle life of the battery. Very good. Um, move on to the next question. Um, so what, could you just uh, talk a little bit about the steps uh, that are usually required to begin an energy storage project? Uh, this question comes from someone working in Pakistan and they're looking to start a project at the institutional or commercial level. Um, can you just talk a little bit on how they might begin that process? Uh, uh, is this a question uh, addressed to me or, uh, or, well, I can try to provide uh, also a small answer and somebody can complement it? Yeah, that'd be fine. I, it was just addressed to all the panelists, but... Yeah. 
Okay. So first thing uh, I would say quickly uh, to establish the horizon of the project. So if you're looking at a say a long-term solution, meaning that for example you are in rural electrification and you don't expect the grid to be there for a long time or uh, you are looking at, at, at a long term solution typically 10 years say or even 15 that's the first step because you could be looking also at a relatively shorter term solution <coughs> because maybe you you are uh, with a bad quality grid or uh, you you expect that the needs will disappear in in 5 years so once you have established the, the time frame this already uh, gives you uh, uh, the option when you have to calculate over the cycle life of the battery, like Romina said, uh, if you are aiming at at, to, uh, at getting as much cycles as possible, or you have a finite horizon. The next thing is to uh, calculate your capacity. <laughs> Typically, this is what we call autonomy. So uh, you have your typical uh, reference load, which is the, the load that you want to be storing in the battery, the demand, and you want to establish if you are looking at a short-term uh, autonomy, typically a few hours, or a long-term autonomy, typically from uh, three to six days. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives you an order of magnitude of the what it's called the, the practical capacity of storage that you need, then this you have to increment because different batteries, technologies, uh, allow you what is called the depth of discharge, which is different. Yeah? Some batteries will allow you to be completely discharged, some will allow you to be discharged only say 80% or 50%. So if the battery that you are looking at is only uh, going to be discharged 50%, uh, your uh, rated capacity is going to be double than the practical capacity that you need, as an example. So, this, uh, uh, you choose the, the battery size approximately, you compare prices, and then uh, for different uh, um, technologies or models, and then you do a check of the cycles. So, you calculate how many uh, cycles is that battery going to do in a typical discharge and recharge cycle over say for example one year and, and that will allow you to see uh, how long is going to be the life of the battery in cycles. Then you compare this to what it's called the, sh the shelf or the service life of the battery because batteries in some technologies even if you just keep them in floating they will also end up uh, eventually uh, failing because of uh, uh, chemical reactions and, and you try to match that both are similar. Then is when you are going to get the best value for your investment. But this is very generalistic. Uh, there are textbooks just dedicated to sizing batteries. So, so I'm just giving you a, a quick insight of the methodology. And this is Richendo, if, if I can just add to that, um, if, the, if the question is a broader question um, that, that's also looking at the, the broader uh, design of the system, um, then I would definitely encourage the uh, questioner to look if they haven't already been utilizing it at the, uh, the home energy software for modeling um, system sizing that also incorporates various types of, of uh, of battery storage um, and they can find more information about the simulations that Homer can help with modeling for the incorporation of the whole system at uh, homerenergy.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just add like 10 things that you should consider when designing a system and so some of them were actually men mentioned by uh, Javier so like the load you need to look at that then um, how your loads will like grow in in the future, uh, the depth of discharge, then the autonomy that you want for that battery. If you there will be days that you will not have sun. The temperature is also very very important, and a lot of people don't consider that when sizing 
the battery bank, uh, then the voltage of the battery bank related with the size of the inverter, and then you have you know to go to the implementation side of uh, the project and see you know where that system will be installed if you have like enough enough space and yeah take in consideration if you want to do maintenance or no and then decide which battery do you want to use. All right, thank you. Um, we do have quite a few more questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, what we usually do in this scenario is I will email out the questions to all of the panelists and allow them to respond accordingly. Um, there are a few that are directed at specific presentations, so I will sort those out for you. Um, so again, I just want to thank everyone for their time and their presentations today. And just quickly, we would like to ask the attendees to take a quick survey. And this just provides feedback on how the webinar went and gives us information to improve in the future. So the first question for the survey, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And the second question is the webinar's presenters were effective. And the last question. Overall, the webinar met my expectations. All right, thank you for answering the survey. Again, I will be emailing out the questions to all the parents, panelists so that they can get back to you on, on those. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend a hearty thank you to our expert panelists, Roshenda, Xavier, Thomas, Jose, and Romina, and to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. I invite our attendees to check the Solutions Center website over the next few weeks. If you'd like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, as well as any previously held webinars. Additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. We also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solution Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy support. Please have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again in future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. This concludes our webinar. Rashonda, are you there? All right, Rashonda might be having some technical difficulties, so we're going to skip the, the UN introduction for now, and we'll go ahead to Xavier who is presenting on off-grid energy storage. Xavier, welcome. Um, I'm, I'm on the uh, Hello, call. We, we uh, had some problems with my mic, going? so um, we, can, we can go back to my presentation. OK, Rashonda, we'll come back to you at the end after the, uh, the, the presentation. Sean, so, we can start with uh, Rashenda right now. If, if Rashenda would prefer to start first, we can go ahead with her. 